This is an overview of our 1976-911. Uh, the car's headed to Nevada in the USA. I'm going to cover briefly some general principles about the G-Series, um, which this forms part of. Uh, we'll take a drive in the car, we'll talk about performance, weight saving, and the general approach that we took to the rebuild um, for this project. And what we'll end up then with uh, kind of what I believe makes her fairly special, and hopefully there's some insights along the way that you can benefit from. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, this vehicle is uh, one, she's a 1976, so that puts her firmly into G-Series territory. So just as a brief kind of background, uh, G-Series obviously came after the F-Series. Uh, the F-Series ended in uh, 73, in came the G-Series from 74, um, and it ran all the way through to 89. Split up into effectively three sub-series, which was the 2.7, the SC, and then the 3.2 uh, before the 964 came in. Uh, the most distinguishing factor of the G-Series um, is the impact bumper, front and rear. Um, brought in by US legislation, the car needed to be able to handle, without any damage to itself, uh, kind of an impact uh, at up to eight, uh, I think eight kilometers an hour, five miles per hour. Um, and there's kind of different types of shock absorbers that sit inside those bumpers as a result of that. The aesthetic of the, the G-Series bumper, I believe, is, is really coming into its own uh, at the moment. It used to be somewhat the less preferred aesthetic. But it's interesting how tastes change uh, and how it is that that particular bumper um, is now becoming quite quite sought after and where I think a lot of the collectors are heading. Um, so she's a, a 76 uh, as I've mentioned. She's also, and I'll talk about this since we're right here, uh, she's a base model 76. So she came out with a, a single side mirror. Um, that mirror in fact turned into a steel mirror um, from 1976. So we've taken a smaller bit of creative license by um, using one of the original chrome mirrors um, uh, that really would only have been available from 75 and downwards but the aesthetic is what we were after and it is an original part. So uh, she would have come out with, yes as I mentioned, a 2.7 litre motor, all of 150 horsepower to 160 horsepower depending on um, where in the range you managed to kind of fit in um, and we've taken that up much higher which we'll talk about later. Um, other aspects about the G-Series uh, versus the F they are kind of renowned to be, and at least when they came in, quite heavy uh, in relation because of these impact bumpers and uh, quite sedentary to drive, in fact. Um, the F-Series ended up, um, at least the 2.2S, um, went all the way up to 180 horsepower. And yet, by the time the new series came in, the base model was pushing out all of 150, um, up to 160, and then the S model up to 170. So they took a bit of a step down. Um, due to a number of things that Porsche was going through at the time, uh, Gulf oil crisis, etc. Many things changed for everybody. But um, in their original guise, beautiful cars, um, but somewhat sedentary to drive. Uh, we focused in on that, and I think we've got something quite unique, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So she is um, um, a stock, standard looking uh, 2.7 litre 911 G Series. Um, now let's have a kind of discussion about certain other bits that obviously you're going to pick up. She carries a, a very unique paint colour. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to colour. Uh, we just believe it has to be right. Um, this car, I'm not too sure what it's going to present like on your digital screen, but it is it is formally a, a grey, but she will, in, in, and in fact the more light that she receives, the greyer she gets and the flatter the colour goes. Aside from, in fact, which is very difficult to show, a very small, uh, almost imperceptible, you can't see it in slides I'm afraid, almost imperceptible metallic flick. Uh, the paint was mixed uh, working in conjunction with our client, we quite like that process, and um, uh, we mixed the paint up accordingly. So the result is, is a car that's almost chameleon-like. Um, the light's setting now, so she's picking up a bit of the warmth that you'll get um, at this time of the evening, so presenting a little bit darker. Whereas in, oops, sorry, whereas in the mid midday, you know, she presents quite a lot flatter and grayer. Under artificial light, she in fact shows a little bit of blue. Yeah. Anyway, so she's got a unique paint color. Um, it's not a Porsche color. We mix a lot of our paints bespoke, not as a rule, but we do often do that. And um, yeah, so overview wise, that's what she is. The only other remarkable thing is that she carries bright uh, trim work. So the bright trim work was an option on all the 911s right up to 1979 in fact, and then they turned black. Um, so the, the window frames, um, the little kind of rings around the headlamps, um, these were originally chrome or bright as we call them. 
um, and that's what makes this particular model these these kind of either the early SCs or in fact the earlier 2.7s quite special in my opinion because they still originally carry their bright trim work um, and it's such a distinguishing factor of these classic 911s. I think what we should perhaps talk about is um, how she drives. So let's let's hop in the car, take a little drive, uh, and we'll talk about a few important aspects, which I'll then get into the detail of later. Right. So we're going to do a bit of driving. Um, I'm going to give an idea of kind of this, the, the characteristics of a car of this nature, in terms of how it feels, just give you an idea of how it feels. Um, and you know the driving will be somewhat normal we're not going to track the car the car could be tracked i guess uh, in our experience um, cars of this nature the option to track the car on a on a porsche porsche club weekend um, fantastic it'll probably do quite well um, so i guess the option to be able to take a car onto the track i believe is more valuable than in fact building a track car which then becomes undrivable in and normal conditions so we're going to do some some normal driving conditions on a weekend to give an idea of what that means um first thing is uh, difficult i guess for um, you to be able to hear but there's a there's a really beautiful engine note to this particular um, setup the 2.7 liters um, rev much higher than the three liters we've taken this to 2.8 as i may have mentioned so but the, the fundamental setup of the motor is a high revving motor and um, it, it loves to gain revs very quickly. So whilst it has slightly smaller amounts of torque than the more, I guess, uh, you know, generic 3 litre, which is a wonderful motor as well, um, the 2.7 loves to kind of you know, pick up its revs really quickly. And it, it's a very interesting thing. It's a bit like alchemy and chemistry. You know, there's a certain alchemy to to the motor setup where on paper you can't really explain what makes it so unique um, but in driving it you can absolutely feel you know what it is that you get so the 2.7 likes to rev um, and it gets to those revs very quickly um, so you can uh, it's, got a, it's got an entirely different style to it to the three liters um, or the three liter motors um, i personally so i love them both Seven litre racing car, racing setup, which has got slightly tighter gearing than normal. A custom cam. The cam makes it quite difficult to drive. We'll talk about the cam setup in this car separately. Uh, but the thing about that racing car is that it is extremely quick uh, and it just loves to rev. So, you know, don't don't always judge a motor based on you know what the spec says on the paper. It's got so much torque and so much power. How a motor delivers its torque, where it where it comes in, where it hits maximum torque, um, how long it takes to hit maximum torque. You know, um, all these factors have a, a significant impact on, on how a motor feels when you, when you drive it. And, and let alone that, how a motor then connects uh, to a gearbox. Uh, in other words, the tightness of the gearing or the length of the gearing as we sometimes refer to it as. If you get that combination right, in other words, if you've got motor which hits its maximum torque at a specific point which relates then um, integrates with your gear change you get a motor that just just works now it's not just about building bigger more powerful motors it's actually about a considered balance of uh, a motor that has got uh, uh, a motor that's got a, a really beautiful setup that allows you to drive the way that you want to drive it. Okay, so let's talk about this motor now specifically. It's a 2.7 litre casing um, up to a 2.8. Uh, the barrels and the sleeves are obviously larger, the pistons are larger, you get more displacement. You've also got a higher compression piston. Uh, that compression gives you more power. Uh, there, and there's a limit to what you can take compression. It's, it's gonna be, I guess it's the easiest and most efficient way to get more power other than displacement. There are certain limits given the quality of one's floor that you can access. But this motor specifically, 2.7 up to 2.8, uh, so it's still got all those high revving, fast revving characteristics. Uh, the extra displacement gives it a little bit more kind of oomph or you know, kick, torque, if you want to call it that, without any sacrifice to the way in which it likes to pick up its revs. Uh, then what it's got is, a, is a, a custom cam setup. So, you know, we, not to get too technical about it, but um, 
the cam is somewhat the cam design, the profile of the cam uh, and its design is somewhat limited to the collaboration that you want to keep on a car. Um, if you've got downdraft carburetors, um, you can get quite aggressive with your carbs. In this car, we've opted to keep a, a kind of a good balance of, of drivability and comfort. Um, and what we're doing is so, um, we're keeping the Cajetronic carbs in this car. So, you know, I, I just love the ability to kind of fiddle with kind of finding the, the ultimate balance of, of a Porsche motor setup. Seven, up to a 2.8, we've got um, a beautiful high revving motor, we've matched that um, with a cam that allows us to get the maximum amount of performance out of this vehicle within, let's call it the constraints of what the KJ Tronic um, configuration allows for. So what I'm really looking for here is smoothness, the smoothness of a, of a KJ Tronic uh, injection fuel setup power, uh, a kick, and a feel uh, of traditional downdraft cars. And I, I dare I say, I think this car, almost more so than, than not any of the others, but many of the others that we've built, has got a remarkably good balance. So, um, and, and I think in this case specifically, we're now doing roughly 120 kilometers an hour. We're in fourth gear. Which is top gear in this car. I think the setup of this car is quite unique because of its four speed gearbox. This is a 76 911 stock, not a 911S. It's got a four speed 915 box. The four speed has got a very specific gearing to it, obviously, uh, versus the five. There's certain ratios that are shorter and longer. You don't lose on the top end, but what you get is a slightly different setup in first, second, and third. And with our added talk of the displacement, our custom cam um, linked to this four-speed box is just leading to such an, a kind of a surprisingly fast car. I think, and again, I'd love to give ourselves credit if we sat down with an Excel spreadsheet and, and worked out the, you know, the perfect, I don't know, on paper balance of gearing to cam setup. It isn't that. It's, it's somewhat alchemy. You, you try and you see how it feels and this one has just fallen into place. So, I guess without giving too much away, but go ahead. There's something very magical about a 915 four-speed box that's matched to a 2.7 litre up to 2.8 that's got that beautiful revving characteristic that still keeps the smoothness of the, uh, of the carburation. I think in this case, uh, I'm fairly certain of it in fact. A lot of how this car is feeling and how it's driving has actually got to do a lot of as well with its weight loss. Right, let's talk about weight saving. Um, the one thing on this car that is not in any way obvious is the fact that she's, um, well, practically everything that you can see is carbon. Um, the bonnet, carbon. The front bumper, front and rear bumper assemblies are carbon. Uh, the left and right front fenders are carbon. Um, and the rear engine lid or the deck lid is carbon. Um, that takes quite a significant amount of weight out and uh, we'll talk about what that means in terms of a driving experience uh, when we take a drive in her now. So, you know, weight saving um, is an interesting, was probably in my opinion, one of the best ways to kind of change the performance of a car, but not just make it faster, make it drive differently. Um, it's not an easy process and I must be honest, we, we've done a number of cars this way. It's, an, it's a never ending kind of battle of getting, you know, perfect fit. Uh, with, a, with a material that, that, that can be a little bit tricky. It's also quite expensive to work with. Things like shut lines, um, you know, making sure that everything aligns is, is really quite challenging when you're effectively remaking, which we do, all of these parts. They also are susceptible in certain cases to high heat. So either way, uh, what you gain on the springs, oh, sorry, on the swings, <laughs> you don't necessarily lose on the roundabouts because the car itself performs fundamentally differently. So let's... Um, take a little drive in the car shall we and see what what we mean by way of weight saving and what it means to the drive okay next up uh, let's do a little bit of specific driving um, a bit of relatively twisty road we're able to use here uh, let's talk about the, uh, the handling of this vehicle um, the one thing that 
that weight saving gives you, which everybody kind of automatically assumes is all that it gives you, is certainly better acceleration. But there is a significantly more important benefit uh, of weight saving, and specifically where the weight is saved is what um, is what adds to this particular supported feature. So. Um, the G-Series is known for its impact bumper, uh, which has become, from an aesthetic point of view, in fact, quite desirable, uh, and I believe it's going to lead to, and uh, become even more so, uh, in the next five to ten years, quite significantly so. But um, the impact bumper comes with these massive big chunks of steel, you know, attached to these kind of fairly rudimentary shock absorbers, which add on a significant amount of weight to the G-Series cars. And uh, in this car, we've replaced front and rear bumper assemblies with carbon, which removes a, a significant amount of weight, but it removes it from the very front and rear, the very kind of furthest apex point of the front and the rear of the car. So then what happens is, it's a bit like, you know, you, you're, you're effectively moving the center of gravity, not moving the center of gravity, what you're doing is you're kind of taking away that pendulum effect where you've got a significant amount of weight on the front or on the rear. So if you're, if you're turning in, you're carrying less weight on the front of the car, which now you need to kind of, against the forces of nature, want to have changed direction. So I kind of come along, I'm now moving to the right. This car just wants to go right, because, you know, that's what I'm telling it to do. We've taken a good, I don't know, I would guess, 20, 30 kilograms, or maybe 20 odd kilograms. I don't know, that, I need to check that. Um, but we've taken a chunk of weight out of the front of the car, and a chunk of weight out of the rear of the car, so that you get less kind of, of this, this pendulum tail effect and you certainly get a car that turns in much more comfortably, much more happily. Um, the bonnet on this car is also carbon, as in fact in this case are the front left and right wings. So we've got a car that is significantly lighter up at the front. There's only so much weight saving we can generate at the rear. There's the, uh, um, there's the engine cover, um, or the bootlet cover, and obviously the rear bumper assembly. So we've certainly lost more at the front than what we have at the rear. It hasn't, in any way, and I often get asked this question, does it affect kind of the handling of the vehicle in terms of, there's now been a slight change to the center of gravity, clearly moving a little bit further backwards. Uh, I can't say that I've in any way picked that up. Uh, we, I have driven one or two ultra lightweight cars, race car setups, where everything is carbon, including the doors, uh, and often a lot of the glass is taken out. And when the cars get super, super light, they actually get very difficult to drive. So all I'm really wanting to stress here is from a drive point of view, so let's take a left twisty here, and we're gonna take a right in a second. Um, the car just effortlessly follows instruction. Go this way, it goes. Go this way, it goes. And there's none of that kind of perceived understeer. Which obviously, you, even if it's not particularly understeering, there's always that perception of you know, you're turning, you're kind of turning left or right, and the car's wanting to continue straight, and you're then having to keep it in line. And of course, you know, massive understeer, which is kind of that can lead to you sliding out of a corner, uh, as against oversteer, which you know is, is another side effect of having too much weight on the very peripheral of the car. Understeer can be absolutely catastrophic as well. So. The lesson about weight saving isn't just how much weight you save, and I'm going to argue that if you save too much weight out of a 911, they get a little bit scary to drive and braking specifically becomes a problem. It's where you save the weight. Save the weight at the very front, at the very rear, um, at the peripherals effectively, and you're going to get a car that drives differently, that performs differently, that feels, um, I don't know, more live, lively, I guess is a term. The, uh, the highway, it feels more lively, um, as against purely taking a whole lot of weight out and kind of, you know, improving your acceleration slightly, which of course is wonderful, nothing wrong with more acceleration, but it isn't the be-all and end-all of everything. Okay, let's take a look at the, uh, in the interior of this car, um, and it'll be a good place to kind of start the discussion around uh, a few driving characteristics. Um, so for anybody that's not familiar with our, our builds, uh, you know, we have a, I guess the word signature, but we have a signature tan that we use quite, quite a bit. Um, uh, we use uh, a specific kind of grade of carpet that's got a, you know, a whole bunch of texture to it. Not too knobbly. I don't want it to feel like a 356. 
um, but certainly a lot of texture yeah, texture there. Um, we try and keep the rest to kind of as stock standard as we can. Sim simple is hard, as I like to say. Uh, obviously, everything is leather covered, leather dash, leather kick plates. Uh, we'll talk about the seats later. Um, and, you know, full setup in the rear uh, for the kids and the dogs uh, in terms of, you know, remolded, refound seats. Everything, not a, a single thing is skipped in terms of the rebuild. But the interior is, is purposefully kept to kind of to as original as it can. I'm a big believer in, um, you know, not getting too wild with modifying dials and dashes and, and, and so on. Uh, and steering wheels, That's those are all stock standard, um, obviously totally refurbished items. There's one little little feature which I do want to talk about, which is this Hoyer dash clock. Um, very difficult to come by now, very, very hard to find uh, and getting very expensive. But because this car's got a little bit of a performance feel to it, which we also will cover in the drive, you know, that gives you the option to head off to your, you know, your, your Porsche weekend on the track, um, if you wish, you know, and kind of, you know, test your lap times. Um, those were, you know, those aren't just adornments. They are, that's a, that's a, that's an original Hoyer rally dash clock, um, which is also period specific to this car, um, which was used, uh, or they were used, you know, for time purposes in rallies. And they in fact run to 24 hours, depending on which stage you're running in. So that's just one little touch, which we quite like. Um, she has a 915 box. We will definitely cover aspects of that in a second, but from an interior point of view, that's how she looks on the inside. Uh, what we might as well talk about is, Yes, she's got a lot of weight saving to her, and as a result, she carries these um, these RS doors. You know, a little bit of weight saved by way of the removal or the loss or the taking out of the door handles and so on. Quite heavy, to be honest. And also, then there's this kind of you know, kind of a nice aesthetic that one gets with um, you know these various original parts. So that's an RS spec door handle. That's not um, original to the age of this car. So that I guess would be one thing which we've done slightly outside of. What the guys in white coats are going to appreciate when she goes to concourse. Another thing I'd like to cover is uh, the seats in this car. These are our lightweight racing seats. Uh, they're made out of a carbon or a carbon Kevlar composite. They're broadly based on the Recaro pole position seat, which as I understand is only available in fiberglass. We've made a few slight design modifications with that base. Uh, they're made by a specialist that we work with. Uh, the benefit of a racing seat, look, we spec these seats into cars which are lightweight in nature. We, we, we wouldn't often, just for aesthetic purposes, put them into um, our more kind of regular builds. Uh, but for any form of lightweight vehicle where we've, you know, we're trying to save weight and up performance, uh, we'll, we'll tend to spec them or clients would like them. Um, and there are kind of three benefits that you get from, that, from them. Uh, the first is, sure, weight saving. So uh, the tombstone seats that they replace in the G-Series can be quite heavy. So there's around 12 to 20 kilograms that are saved um, in, this, in, in, in fitting these seats, especially the later G-Series seats carry a lot of electric motors and things, extremely heavy. Um, so there's a, there's a simple weight saving gained from swapping out. The second one is generally support. They're incredibly supportive seats. So they're designed for racing, racing often in endurance you're going to spend three to four hours going around on a track. Um, comfort, or believe it or not, is in certain cases more important than your passenger comfort. Um, so they, they're very, very supportive. But more importantly, which is the third reason, is that they are laterally very supportive. So there's, there's no lateral movement in the seat whatsoever. When you use it for proper racing purposes, one will use a four-point racing harness. We haven't set this car up for that. Uh, and you may well, you know, um, that's a common, common racing benefit or trick is you strap yourself into a, um, into a racing car to allow for no movement whatsoever. You do that for safety purposes and you do that um, more so to be able to have all of the car's feedback come through your body. So any form of loss of traction, any form of over or understeer, before you sense it happening by way of visually, you will feel it in your body if you are fully strapped into a seat where there's no lateral movement. So a major benefit of a lightweight, these lightweight racing seats is it'll give you immediate feedback through the car into your body. It makes you a more confident driver. Um, it, I would argue, can make you a better driver. Um, and, um, you know, it does that comfortably and it does it in such a way that, you know, it also gives you support. Um, one thing that you compromise is rear access. Um, this car is being shipped, in fact, with both its original seats, the tombstones, obviously done up in our leather. 
um, and then the, the lightweights. And what we then do um, is it's two bolts out, seat slide out. You can swap backwards and forwards between the traditional seats and the lightweights uh, for access to the rear, uh, children, seats, etc. that you may need. That's an overview then of our seats. Okay, uh, maybe let's, because we're heading onto the on-ramp now. I'll give you an idea of how the car accelerates. Uh, she's got a, oof, I mean, if I was to compare this to what the car felt like in her original guys, uh, this, you know, straight kind of steel setup and the, you know, the motor in its original guys, this is fundamentally different. So let's just give her a bit of willy. So the revs, as you can hear, come in really quickly. It starts to really open up at around 5,000 revs. Four to five, six, seven. In fact, this car will comfortably go over seven. I just don't want to do that because she's got all of... 350 kilometers on her since we rebuilt her. Um, and we need to just at least give these pistons a chance to settle into their barrels. So we're now in fourth, we're doing 150 kilometers an hour. Let's go to Cape Town. Okay, so by way of a summary, um, this project um, is a very good example of uh, one of our or performance oriented builds um, and uh, the reason I'm quite proud of it is that it, it takes a, a model that um, to the average person wouldn't seem like the most obvious candidate for a performance build um, but we've chosen that model for a number of reasons uh, one of which is the fact that she's a g-series uh, second of which is that she kind of sits in that kind of fairly conservative series within uh, the G-Series, um, that kind of a base level 2.7 litre. Um, and we've transformed the car into something which is uh, quite remarkable, but yet at the same time, she's, um, I would like to think, kind of capable of winning a concourse if that was something that was important to the owner. Um, I think the, the trick or what, what makes her particularly special is, I guess somewhat fortuitous in terms of how things have come together. Uh, we've increased the power of the motor, which has been covered in quite a bit of detail, taken out some weight, and then combined with a, a four-speed gearbox, she's got a truly remarkable drive. Um, and that's something quite special to have, uh, I guess, kind of, kind of come to in conclusion. Um, aesthetically, um, she also celebrates what she is without trying to be anything that she isn't. Uh, she's 100% 1976. Um, and all that we've done is we've focused in with immense detail onto kind of the smaller things that, that kind of make these cars so loved for, for what they are. So uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, stay in touch.